Hi my loves and welcome back. Today I'm going to be doing my June books video. I know it's not long since I did my last books video but like I said I'm trying to catch up beyond time with these videos. So in the wake of the recent developments and happenings in the Black Lives Matter movement I wanted to basically take June to on the one hand read more books by black authors more than I usually would um, and on the other hand continue my own education in race and how it creates and informs our systems of oppression. So this is kind of a twofold thing and um, because of that I'm going to quickly reiterate some of the things that I said in my Black Lives Matter video, in my blog post, um, because black writing is by no means a monolith. These writers come from different places, they have different writing styles, they have different subjects, and they deal with race and racial issues to varying degrees. Some of it deal with it quite directly, others less so. Sorry guys about the background noise, again, um, my microphone is still not fixed and also just everything seems to be going on today. Obviously being black authors means that um, their work often addresses race in part of the writing just as the lived experience of a white author is going to inform the way that they write, the way that they're more often than not white characters live, um, which includes the experience of white privilege. Um, but because this is presented usually as the standardised view, it might not feel as political um, or as obvious, which is part of the problem. I know that grouping these authors and sort of reading books by black authors and putting them all in this video is sort of contributing to that idea that these are like books from minority cultures that are only to be read um, at a particular time, you know, when Black Lives Matter is in the news, for example. Just because I'm reading um, more black authors this month doesn't mean that I won't continue to read them throughout the rest of the year. You guys know that lots of my favourite authors are black authors. I read them often because I just love their work um, and they're great. I could always read more um, and I will probably be reading more, but that also requires publishing houses to publish more black authors. So it's also kind of problematic if you're a white reader or a non-black reader and um, you kind of only turn to black writing to educate you in some way or to provide anti-racist material for you. I'm going to leave a good article down below which kind of talks about um, the anti-racist reading list which I've mentioned a few times. Um, but I read these authors because they are great and in the process often has come learning. Some books are specifically designed to teach but others aren't, especially when they're like fiction or novels. They're there to be a piece of art um, and many aren't even directly for white readers as well. We must make it a habit to read diversely in general and also to read books by black authors that aren't directly about racism or trauma. Um, so that we can kind of get a full idea of the full scope of black life and of life. And that means we aren't reenacting some of those same violences in our reading or expecting our reading to be kind of white centric because it's always about anti-racism. So that's why it's kind of twofold because on the one hand I do want to further my education um, but I also just simply wanted to give more time this month to talk about some great black authors um, and their books. I'm just taking a little bit of extra time today to do so. Um, I'm going to try not to put my foot in my mouth in this video or overstep any boundaries. Obviously I'm a white person who's going to be talking about black writing and no matter how well-meaning I am um, my opinions could be harmful, they could just simply be unwarranted and unneeded and I know there's kind of a danger of me centering myself by talking about this and centering whiteness in all of this so I'm going to try and whip through it as quickly as possible in order to not do that. Um, but I always try and monitor my own thoughts and opinions, um, check my privilege, check myself for latent prejudice and I try and ask myself whether I'm adding anything of value in what I'm saying. And this kind of goes throughout the year, not just now, and I'm, but I'm sure I won't always get that right. You know, it's a very nuanced, tricky thing to navigate. I'm not going to be perfect in all of that. So please feel free to correct me if I get things wrong. Um, but as a white content creator, I do want to still do it, still talk about uncomfortable things um, because we have a duty to do what we can and to speak up and to uplift black voices. So on the one hand I just want to talk to you about some fantastic books, on the other hand if I'm talking about race I'm more kind of addressing my white or non-black audience that might want to learn a little bit more um, but I am not trying to persist position myself as an expert of any sort, I have no lived experience of racism, I never will. Um, and I'm just sharing what I've learnt 
and hopefully that will be a good jumping off point for any of you guys who do want to learn more. I know that lots of you guys are super informed anyway and do not need me to help you. Um, but yes, if I'm talking about race, I am directing that at um, just any of you guys who want to learn a little bit more. But like I said, I am not an expert. We've got a range of writing here that's going to cover all sorts of things, including race. And some of it's going to be difficult and sticky, problematic. And I think if you are a white or non-black reader like me, um, we need to take as much of the responsibility into our hands um, about how we read and doing the work of interrogating how we receive a novel so that black authors can work in their fullest scope um, and for primary audiences who may not be us. So last couple of things, I promise that I will stop yabbering on it in a minute, but this is by no means a panoramic look at black fiction this video, this is just what I read this month um, and like most people I've seen online at the minute, we are all struggling with our concentration levels. I have not read as much as I wanted to this month. For example, I read mostly men this month, which is not great. Um, and also these mean this means that these aren't my all-time favourite books by black authors. However, we do actually have some really good ones in here and some new favourites. Um, but yeah, this isn't like a definitive list of any kind. Um, if you guys do want a list of books by black authors that I think are fantastic, you can go and look at my Black Lives Matter blog post. Um, they're at the bottom of that. Um, and at some point in my life, I'm going to do a favourite books video, or maybe like a favourite books series. But I do want to do some rereading of some books before I do that. But it will happen. And when that happens, that will give me an excuse to talk about some of my favourite books again. But yeah, within reason, I'll be critiquing these books like I normally do. Obviously, I'm going to be mindful by giving an unwarranted opinion. Um, but these are pieces of writing. Most of them are pieces of fiction. And that's what we do here is we look at how an author writes and whether they get across their kind of plot, themes, characterisation, that sort of thing, if they do that successfully. And by all means, please watch this video, but also make sure that you are watching similar videos by black content creators if you are going to consume this sort of content from me. I think that's really important. Right, I shouldn't even have had to say all this because if I had a book video of my majority white authors, nobody would bat an eyelid, but I did just want to tackle some of that in the beginning and just sort of lay a base. And lots of that applies all year round anytime I read a book from an author who has a perspective different from mine. Um, I've also got a couple of books in here which I'd been reading for ages and sort of finished this month. Um, book Club, I mentioned in my last video because you guys didn't have time to read a book between my last video and this video. I'm just going to be doing book club again in my August books video. And this month we are doing two books, one fiction, one non-fiction. We're doing Red at the Bone by Jacqueline Woodson and um, Women, Race and Class by Angela Davis. Uh, yes, so far, right. Now let's get into the video. I'm sorry I had to do all of that, you guys, but I did feel like some of it just needed to be re reiterated, said. I'm actually gonna zoom you out because I feel like I'm cutting the top of my head off and I'm not looking amazing. Right, so here is this month's stack. So we've got a big mix of books in here. Let's start with Baldwin, um, who's an author I've been meaning to read for ages and ages and ages. Um, and because I just sort of felt like there was a big Baldwin shaped gap in my literary knowledge. Um, so I've been meaning to read him for ages and it felt like the right time to dive into some Baldwin. And I actually found it really interesting to read these two books together. So the first one I read was Go Tell It on the Mountain. Um, which is, I believe, his debut novel, yes, um, and it's a piece of fiction. And then um, I've also got The Fire Next Time, which you've probably seen on lots and lots of reading lists recently, and this is um, a couple of essays in here. And the reason they're quite good to read together is because this one sort of picks up where this one leaves off, because this is sort of semi-autobiographical. It's about John Grimes, who is the kind of Baldwin character. He's growing up in 1930s Harlem. He's grappling with his father, who is a minister. He's a preacher. He's also kind of grappling with his relationship to the church um, at a pivotal time in his life. You know, he's 14, he's confused. He's maybe coming to terms with the fact that he's gay and he's just feeling a lot of emotion. It's kind of a coming of age story in that sort of sense. Um, and it's very much about the hypocrisy of the church and its role in African-American lives um, at the time and its kind of role in oppression and repression. And that feeling is kind of personified in um, John's father figure. 
who is a minister and he has all these morals um, and standards but he's also very cruel and abusive towards John. And so we're kind of introduced to John at the beginning of the novel and then we get flashbacks into his aunt's life, his father's life and his mother's life to sort of detail how they ended up in Harlem um, and what came before John basically. Some of the reasons that John's father is as he is and issues of race and racial oppression definitely have a huge effect um, not just on John but particularly in his kind of elders um, and his family members and there's a real sense of that kind of inheritance of trauma um, running through that particularly through the father-son line which I know is a fairly common theme in books but I often read it from the kind of mother-daughter perspective so um, I did find that interesting. Baldwin's writing is so emotive and I wrote in my notes that it was deeply soul troubling um, there's something really readable about his language, um, but it's also completely heart-wrenching. Um, it has a kind of rhythm to it, so sometimes it's just kind of describing events and then we'll kind of go into the character's mind and how they're feeling and all this kind of tumult of emotions, basically. And he writes all of that really, really beautifully. And he kind of knows when to kind of zoom in and zoom out the character's mind. Um, and I also think there's just like, like a real sense of like a deep vulnerability in his writing and it's just something that you don't find often in an author is that real ability to tap into emotion in such a kind of deep way if you know what I mean. And towards the end of the book John has this kind of spiritual awakening of sorts but what I love about it is that there's real spirituality in the writing and something definitely happens. It's very affecting, it's very... Um, moving and it certainly was for me but also at the same time there's a, there's a very nu nuanced portrait going on you know this spiritual awakening doesn't solve all of John's problems he's still got problems with his father he's still facing problems with his sexuality as he's growing into it um, and nothing is resolved which I think I liked about this book. It's really not trying to create binaries out of things, um, but it's more just looking at the mess that is um, human life, human emotions, especially when those come into contact with race, with class, with gender, with sexuality. But yeah, so there's no perfect conclusion. And I think there's a real sense of that adolescent confusion as well, which I appreciated. Um, and I think Baldwin does that really, really well. From my perspective, I also thought Baldwin did a good job of writing um, women and particularly inserting, um, you know, feminist issues into this book, like the emotional labour of women, particularly black women, um, the emotional labour that they carry out um, on behalf of the men in their lives. And I thought he did a good job of looking at how gender can intersect with religion, with class, with race, especially for a male author, um, particularly one writing at this time. But yes, all in all, I'd highly, highly recommend this book. I found it really, really moving. So then there's The Fire Next Time, which, like I said, it consists of two essays. The first is fairly short. It's a letter to his nephew um, on the 100th anniversary of the emancipation, essentially sort of addressing um, racism and how that's going to affect his nephew's life, how it's affected the lives of those who've gone before him. And then there's a longer essay called Down at the Cross, Letter from a Region in My Mind, which is a sort of meandering look at various things, particularly religion, and that's why it's kind of good to read in conjunction with this one because um, it sort of picks up where this one leaves off. So Baldwin's talking about his life as a teenage preacher after his sort of um, spiritual awakening moment and his subsequent difficulties with the church, with his father, um, and how, you know, he eventually sort of became disillusioned, disillusioned with the church as a whole. And then it kind of talks about his meeting with Elijah Muhammad and his experiences having dinner um, with him and um, what the Nation of Islam was kind of doing in Harlem at the time and um, what that was offering to African-American people, what that wasn't offering to African-American people and how he doesn't find it wholly convincing um, but that there are persuasive things about it and again we're getting quite a nuanced picture of things there. Um, there is so much quotable stuff in here, many of it is painfully 
sadly relevant today and I do think it's just like an important read if you're interested in black history, if you're interested in black writing um, from one of the great black writers. Um, so it's well worth a read, you can do it in an afternoon as well, it's a tiny wee book so there's really no excuse. <laughs> but yeah, Baldwin still managed to carry a lot of that emotion through the writing even though it's non-fiction um, and there's a lot of feeling through these essays which I think makes them really powerful and I think what makes them still very popular today. There is some stuff in here that's a little bit outdated, um, of course, as with all books that are not contemporary, but I still think it's a really important read. Um, it's not what I expected at all, I don't know what I was expecting from Baldwin, but um, he really surprised me. I think the sheer emotion of his language really surprised me and I will definitely be reading more. I really want to read Giovanni's Room. Um, that is on my list. Okay, now I have something a little bit more light-hearted, if you can say that serial killers are light-hearted. Um, this is My Sister the Serial Killer by Oyinkan Braithwaite, um, who is a Nigerian-British author. And this book is unsurprisingly about a woman whose sister is a serial killer. She keeps killing her boyfriends or love interests, um, and she keeps asking the narrator to come and help with cleanup. So immediately we're kind of confronted with this cool slick straightforward prose um and these very kind of tiny little chapters i don't know if you can see they're really short and these kind of give like snapshots of different scenes basically it does feel a bit like cinematic in that way um and also very thriller-esque this is obviously a thriller um but one that really plays with a lot of those tropes which i really appreciate um, and it sort of holds you at a remove from the characters in the plot because of its style and because of that choppiness. Um, so you don't get caught up with the emotions and the scene setting elements. Um, but more the kind of dynamic between the sisters, some of the things that Braithwaite is talking about, and some of the other themes. So Ayula, who is committing these murders, is very beautiful and she kind of gets away with it because she's very beautiful and nobody suspects her. Kareda or Kareddy um, is the old, put upon older sister who has to step in. She's not as attractive as her younger sister, so she has to step in um, and help her out and get her out of the mess and also finds herself sort of under her sister's spell as well. You know, she's the less favoured child in her mother's eyes and I remember this good line, I haven't actually got my notebook here with me, um, but there was this good line about how families commit murders just by sort of making you into something that they want you to be rather than who you really are. And there's also an element in here of reclaiming some of that violence enacted on women's bodies, um, both within and without fiction. Um, within thrillers, you know, women are often violated, mutilated, killed. I know that probably won't sit right with everyone. I really appreciated what Braithwaite was doing there because she's really switching those roles, making the woman the perpetrator um, and handing her some of the power. Um, and there's sort of an element of um, revenge as well through that because the knife that Ayula is using belonged to the girl's father who was very abusive and these men kind of keep getting duped by Ayula even in the most suspicious of circumstances because of her beauty um, and kind of their own vanity there for two and because they're shallow um, so it's sort of a feminist revenge on on those who seek to fetishize I can never say that word fetishize um, and own Ayula um, so that sounds quite heavy but the book has quite a light touch it gallops along you know it's very quick um, it's almost ironic and denaturalizing in that style like I said um, it kind of keeps you at a remove it is supposed to be kind of funny and light and misbehave and yeah it's a really interesting take on a thriller and I really enjoyed it. Um, it's a quick read, it's good for us who have, are having trouble concentrating and reading at the moment. But yeah, it's not a deep exploration of what it means to be sisters who are in cahoots in some major crimes, but it's a kind of fun, quick thriller um, and I would definitely recommend it if you're after that sort of thing. I've just read a um, review at the beginning calling it a deliciously kitschy thriller. And I think kitschy is probably quite a good word for it actually. Okay. Now we're going to talk about The White Boy Shuffle by Paul Beattie. Um, so this book kind of broke me. <laughs> um, it was this book that kind of tipped me over the edge. I've been thinking for a while that I hate, not hate, but that I find it really difficult to rate books on Goodreads between one and five stars. Um, and that in general rating books is just really difficult for many, many reasons. 
Um, and this one just broke me and I thought, I can, there's no way I can rate this. So I'm going to give up. So now I'm no longer rating books on Goodreads, which I know is probably annoying for you guys who kind of want to get a sense of, a quick sense of how I felt about a book. And I know, and I know it's kind of hypocritical of me because I actually find um, the ratings of books relatively helpful on Goodreads. I've just decided it's too much. And I just want to let the books um, kind of categorise themselves and show their full complexity um, through my reviews and I don't want to kind of try and narrow that down into ratings if you know what I mean. So this book is about a black teenager who um, is living in Santa Monica, he's kind of like a surf bum kind of character um, and when his mother sort of thinks he's too far removed from black culture and his racial identity she moves him to urban west Los Angeles. Um, Los Angeles? How do I say that? Which is already kind of setting up certain assumptions and ideas about black identity in itself, on the west coast particularly, and that's something that BT is definitely aware of and sort of playing up. And yeah, the contrast between who the protagonist was and who he sort of becomes is the driving force behind much of this book and he kind of starts playing into a lot of stereotypes in a sort of self-aware, ironic way. We need to talk about BT's style because he is unlike any author I've ever come across. Um, I read this sellout when he won the man booker for it in 2016 and I would actually really 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 like to reread it because now that I am a bit more of a mature reader um, and probably will understand some of the references a little bit better um, because I found it to be good but I also found it to be overwhelming I felt like a lot of it went over my head. So lots of people describe this book as kind of satire um, or Paul Beatty's writing in general as kind of satire and as laugh out loud. Um, and I think there are certainly elements of that in there, it, it's definitely in there, but I also found this book to be deeply tragic and actually very heart-wrenching. Like I said, it just kind of broke my brain a little bit. I have my notes just here, by the way, you guys, so if I'm looking down, I'm looking at my notes because I want to <laughs> make sure I'm not just spewing any old crap out my mouth. Um, but BT basically has this like no hold barred approach. Nothing is sacred to BT. Um, and even though you're only reading it, it feels like kind of an assault on the senses um, with all the scenes and the characters and the references and the sort of events that he sets up. Um, it's immensely quick and witty and dazzling. It's going to bombard you with stuff basically and it might feel a bit disjointed as a result. I know some people have a problem with it feeling disjointed. I personally don't care, I just want to go along for the ride. I think in order to get some of his references you are going to need to have a little bit of knowledge of black history and black culture. Um, obviously I'm no expert but I still managed <laughs> to get along and I certainly didn't get them all. Um, and I kind of kept Google handy. Um, for those sort of bigger references that I knew would probably help me understand the book a little bit better. So there is a plot here and after the introduction which um, is essentially kind of a background of Gunner's family, Gunner being the main character, BT sort of setting up different situations for Gunner to be in and it does feel a bit episodic in that way. But yeah, it essentially cuts through everybody's bullshit including with regard to race and racial injustice um, and it will, if you're reading it right, undoubtedly upset you. Um, it shows the sheer complexity of racial politics as well as the absurdity of it and how it shouldn't be so complex. Um, and the way BT kind of melds together all of his references along with the storyline and the characters and still manages to kind of make something that's entertaining and heartbreaking and at times funny feels completely genius and completely like anyone else that I've ever read. He sort of like deconstructs a lot of it and then builds it up before your eyes again so you're kind of looking at things through a kaleidoscope almost. Um, the writing can go from being lyrical, there's some poetry in here, to being dry as a bone and it kind of shapeshifts throughout the book along with Gunner himself um, and the ending really broke my heart. Quickly need to address this I feel. Um, I say if you're reading it right because I feel if you're a white reader approaching this book you need to be careful and you need to self monitor how you are reacting to it. I certainly don't think you should be finding absolutely everything like riotously funny. I don't think some of the jokes are for us. I don't think some of the characters are for us to poke fun at. I think some readers will also find his use of suicide as a kind of trope in this book um, to be quite upsetting so just a trigger warning on that one. Um, it won't sit right with everyone but like I said BT holds 
nothing back. And I think it's the point of his work is to cross those boundaries, to push things to their absurd limit. Um, I worried at times that white readers would really take aspects of the book wrong and use it to allow themselves to be derisive towards black culture or racist. Um, but I think this is a dangerous spot to put black authors in is to kind of um, police what they can and can't write in case non-black readers will take it wrong, particularly with regard to something as satiric and self-aware as this anyway. So I certainly don't think I would recommend this book to someone that is new to black literature or is kind of new to anti-racism work. Um, but if you feel like you want to tackle something challenging, that's entertaining, that's probably completely unlike anything you've ever read before, then you should try BT. Um, there's going to be slightly problematic things in here, there's going to be things that make you cringe, but it seems kind of important to make that space for BT and other writers like him to do that kind of stuff um, in the same way that we allow a lot of scope for white writers to do it and to be controversial. And I'm also going to link up a couple of interviews that I read um, with him down below, just because I found them interesting. Um, to read and think about in conjunction with this book. And I have very swiftly bought his other novels, um, Tough and Slumberland, and I'm gonna read and I'm gonna reread the cellar at some point. Um, so yes. So this is another book which has kind of controversy surrounding it, sort of for similar reasons, even though it's very, very different. Um, I'm sorry, I realised that this is super dark today because it is a gloomy, horrible day outside. I'll hold it over this side. Um, so this is Native Son by Richard Wright. This was published in 1940 um, and I found out about this book from Hina or Bookish Babe. Um, she is fantastic, I will leave a link to her channel down below. This was in her first video I believe where she's talking about her favourite book. She's relatively new to YouTube but she is great. And she also reads a lot of literary fiction which I love because I feel like that's not quite as common in the booktube space. So this book was published in 1940, so it's a little bit before James Baldwin's time, just a tiny bit, and it was Wright's first novel. Um, and I think he'd published a book of short stories before this, and what he'd learned from those stories and publishing stories about black life was that a lot of pe white people were reading it and then sort of feeling pity but not understanding their own role in maintaining um, oppression and racial injustice. So he wrote this book to kind of to kind of show white readers that did read it um, their responsibility in how racism works in the world and in the world of 1930s America and how that's often made instrumental through capitalism um, because he was at the time of writing this I believe very um, involved in kind of communism or learning about communism and he eventually became disillusioned by it I think but it plays a big part in this novel. Um, if you get this edition it's certainly worth reading the introduction by Carol Phillips who I believe is a Caribbean British author. I think I have one of his books off oh, here, yeah. it's called The Final Passage, oh I can't get it out. And I actually don't remember very much about this book which is strange because I read this as part of a course at uni and I remember all the other books really vividly but not this one for some reason. What I do remember about Carol Phillips is that he wrote or had this kind of exchange with Chinua Chebi about the value of Joseph Conrad's um, Heart of Darkness and he sort of wanted to reiterate its value even though it's immensely racist um, and Chinua Chebi definitely didn't and I'll link that up down below if you guys are interested. Completely random. But anyway, um, so I remember Carol Phillips for that specifically. But anyway, he wrote the introduction to this. It's very useful um, of this edition. It's very useful for kind of contextualising this book, this book a little bit. But yes, anyway. It's about a young man named Bigger Thomas. He is only 20 years old. He lives on the south side of Chicago and he has this kind of profound fear and hatred in him for basically everyone in the world. Because he's growing up in poverty, because he's prevented from doing all these things that he, want, he wants to do because of his race. He can't find anything kind of meaningful to do. Um, so he goes to work for this white family who on the surface seem very philanthropic. Um, you know, they claim to have given five million dollars to, to black schools, but it turns out um, that they actually own the building that his family live in and they charge exorbitant rent to black renters which they don't charge to white renters for similar properties and they also don't allow black renters to move outside of their kind of segregate, segregated zone of the city through refusing to rent to them um, in other parts of the city so yes 
So obviously there's a lot of hypocrisy going on there. But yeah, essentially this fear and hatred um, leads him to start committing murders. Um, and sort of accidentally playing into all the stereotypes of black masculinity at the time just as a result of his experiences in the world. I don't think I'm spoiling it too much but at the end of this book we get this big speech from um, a lawyer of Biggers about how we don't need to pity him or see him as a victim but we do need to address the environment that essentially caused him to commit these murders, that things need to be changed structurally and that capitalism plays a big role in this. Um, so, as Carol Phillips says, I've got this quote here, um, the book shows how both blacks and whites are likely to be ensnared in a nightmare of savagery and physical and emotional pain unless somebody addresses the problems of American racism. It's kind of how that environment really encourages that hatred and fear. Um, and essentially some people have found this book problematic, including James Baldwin. I haven't actually read his essay on this book, but Carol Phillips talks about it a little bit in the beginning of this book. Um, because it represents Bigger as this stereotype, as this kind of like, he is white people's greatest fear sort of thing come come to life and that he's also just not a very kind of nuanced non-stereotypical character um and i kind of get where baldwin's coming from having not read the essay so please don't quote me on this because i feel like if there were fewer books by black people at the time and this one was like a runaway success like it was a huge thing it sold loads um, I can see kind of where Baldwin might have had a problem with it um, and criticised his book on that basis. And he also criticised his book on the basis that it was more kind of political tract than it was novel um, because it really has something to say. Like it really is not as kind of artistically minded as some of the books that came after Baldwin and Ellison and all of that kind of thing. But like many other readers since, um, I think there's certainly a case to be made for this book. Um, so the book has this incredible narrative tension. It is like a thriller and so for that reason I do think it has um, artistic merit because that is not easy to do and it's really quite incredible how you're kind of pulled along by this book um, and you really find yourself drawn to Bigger even though, despite the horrible things that he does. Um, I also found this book to actually not be super stereotypical. Um, I think it did a remarkable job by exploring um, the nuances of how Bigger feels and the confusion of how he's acting. It's really interesting the way he looks at the ways that kind of race, class, capitalism all intersect. It's a real experience reading this book. It's very intense and I'm very interested in reading more from Richard Wright and I definitely would recommend it. Um, so next we have a book I don't have, which is End of Policing by Alex Vitale, who is not a black writer, but he is addressing race and racial injustice, amongst other things in this book, because it is about policing. And as I hope that we all know by now, police use force disproportionately against black people in the US, in the UK, and also in general because of structural racism, um, police more rigidly police um, black communities and poorer communities as well um, over richer and whiter communities and they're more present in those communities. Um, so this book is more about the US um, because that's where Vitali is writing from and I saw online lots of people calling to abolish the police or radically defund the police and I didn't I just didn't know much about it and I was kind of immediately open to the idea because you know, most people are asking for those um, for that money to be redirected towards um, social services which I know have been massively underfunded here um, and in the US so it kind of makes natural sense to me to move some of that money into some of those services um, but I just wanted to learn more about it and what the alternatives could be and obviously policing is kind of one side of the criminal justice system as a whole which in the US particularly needs overhauling um, and I'm reading The New Jim Crow now to sort of get the other angle which kind of talks about mass incarceration. So essentially Vitali goes in each chapter through issues that the police tackle that they essentially, a lot of them don't need to be tackling at all. There's so much quotable stuff in here, so much good stuff for um, when you're talking to people and you kind of want to tell them some cold hard facts. You know, if nothing else, Vitaly quotes multiple times by police officers, ex-police officers, who say that they just shouldn't be on the front lines of some of this stuff, particularly, for example, with regard to mental health. Um, the police shouldn't be the first person 
that someone who needs mental health help really shouldn't be the first person that they kind of meet um, to help them. For example, with that case, you know, putting them in charge of outreach programs and stuff is going to mean they focus more on people that are overtly committing crimes than other people that also need their help just as much or need help just as much. So he shows how police forces kind of came into being, for example in the UK they're particularly about suppressing social movements um, and in the US often more overtly along racial lines um, finding slaves, keeping communities segregated and just generally protecting property and quelling riots. That was kind of their first role. It still plays a big part in what the police do now even if it isn't as obvious. Um, he shows that reforms often seek to kind of legitimise the role of police rather than actually addressing the problems of having the police as the first port of call um, for a lot of society's problems and how um, the contemporary concern with crime, which they didn't have in the beginning, makes their social control function more palatable, that's a quote. He shows that social moralising and drug prohibition, for example, just doesn't help them make the world a better place or a safer place. Um, and he shows how stable permanent housing and permanent jobs can make a huge difference to a lot of these issues rather than policing and that in fact in a lot of cases would actually be cheaper than funding the police. I reckon for many people this won't be radical enough actually and that a lot of his alternatives sort of do look a little bit like reforms um, and assume the necessity of the state and all sorts. And especially as the book kind of goes on he seems less assured of his own argument. Neither is this a particularly gripping non-fiction read, you know, it's all about kind of, it's quite straightforward, it's quite structured, um, it's very fact-based as opposed to theorising more generally, but that does make it useful in other ways. Um, all in all, I think it's a good introduction to some of these ideas and I found it to be for me and I'll be reading more about these issues in the future. A bit of an outlier here, we've got Proust. What is there to say about Proust? That has not already been said in the world. Um, so after finishing Duck's new report a couple of months ago I needed another kind of difficult book to tackle um, so I decided to start reading In Search of Lost Time which I reckon at the rate I'm going I might finish the whole thing by the end of the year. That's the sort of vibe I'm going for so I probably won't have another difficult book this year. Um, and this is obviously the first volume, this is The Way by Swans kind of more commonly known as Swan's Way. It was called that until very recently. So if you don't know, <laughs> Proust is a kind of canonical modernist writer. He was French, writing in French, so um, this is translated. Um, it was written in the early 20th century, obviously, because he's modernist. Um, I sort of expected this book to be a bit more Joycean but it is actually quite different. Um, and what it is, is essentially this volume is essentially about the narrator's childhood growing up in the late 19th century in aristocratic France um, and it's obviously considered a big masterpiece, one of those kind of must reads if you're kind of into your literary fiction, particularly because he was very influential on a lot of authors that came after him. It's about this, the narrator's childhood and in general it's about involuntary memory and the past and memory in general and it has these long passages and long sentences di dissecting what it means to remember and it sort of meanders through events um, and thoughts and ideas very slowly and dreamily um, and it is kind of a masterpiece and I can see how it's influenced writers um, since um, particularly there's in this one a kind of famous moment where he eats a madeleine and he's taken immediately um, back in time to when he was a child eating a madeleine. So it's about the kind of way memory works I guess. And it's also about the disjunction between how one might feel about something and remember something or anticipate something and then the actual reality of that thing and how difficult it is to pin down reality but also at the same time as he's looking at that disjunction he's also trying to create I think a sort of reality of the mind. He's trying to write down um, that kind of liminality of the mind where you're sort of thinking about something at the same time as kind of viscerally feeling it um, kind of self-consciously looking at how we think the interplay of our kind of memories and subconscious with our daily lives and our kind of thinking brain 
um, and how we come to be basically with all of that. Um, so it is fantastic, it is a bit pretentious, um, sometimes it's a bit dull because it is very dreamy, slow, long, he's going to talk for pages about something very very small but it is kind of great and I think it's well worth reading. I expected it to be a more difficult read. I think it is difficult in terms of like keeping you, like you need to concentrate and you might not be able to take in a lot of it at once because it's quite intense. Um, but it's not, it's not super, super, super experimental like some modernist fiction, if you know what I mean. Um, it's still got a kind of readable element to it. So yes, that is Proust. Um, you'll be seeing more of those volumes hopefully over the rest of the year and hopefully we'll get to the end of In Search of Lost Time by the end of the year. Um, but if you guys don't know, he, I think he's got seven volumes, seven or eight, um, and he didn't really complete it properly so I think some of the later volumes particularly are a bit more fragmentary. Um, but yes, this early one is certainly kind of recognisably a novel. Okay, next I have Arts of Living on a Damaged Planet, which is a kind of collection of essays and it's edited by Anna Tsing, Heather Swanson, Elaine Gann and Niels Bubant. And the reason I bought this is because my beloved Karen Barad has an essay in this book. Um, and it's also a gorgeous book. It's kind of got two sides to it. And it kind of splits in the middle so it, you read it from one side and then you flip it over and read it from the other side. And this book of essays from a huge range of scholars and writers from all sorts of backgrounds and disciplines and they're essentially writing about our damaged planet, how we're destroying it, how we might save it. It's got this sort of ghosts and monsters thing going on so, so the ghosts section um, is about like traces of things in landscapes and stuff and how we might read landscapes and traces and ghosts um, to help us think about our damaged planet and how we might help it and then it's got the kind of monsters aspect which is more looking at kind of our how we're all interconnected and we're all kind of a big monstrous mass um, and looking at how ecologies are all connected um, including animals including us and yes those are sort of the broad themes of this book. I wanted to love this book because of Barad because it has lots of writers in here which I appreciate um, for example Ursula Le Guin also um, wrote something for this book and she's actually got some very beautiful poetry in here but to me it didn't offer what I wanted it to I think because the essays are quite short none of them are above 20 pages and all of them feature quite a lot of pictures and stuff so um, the actual text of each essay can't be very long at all and so I just wanted something a little bit more in depth in some of these topics and a lot of them obviously because they're written by people across lots of disciplines just kind of touch quickly on people's different research interests um, without going into much detail and it sort of feels a little bit disjointed and also as a, as a reader of lots of literature lots of these ideas about ghosts and monsters and stuff is something I can kind of get a little bit better often from reading novels or just reading something longer um, I didn't find that particularly like crazy to me because it's something I'm very used to um, reading about in literature so I did get some interesting science facts here and there from it but it just wasn't as profound or helpful as I wanted it to be. So that is Arts of Living on a Damaged Planet. Um, but, the, but the book itself is beautiful. And I did get some, some sort of little bits of knowledge, but yes, it wasn't as, it wasn't all I wanted it to be. Okay, finally we've got An Unkindness of Ghosts by River Solomon, which is a science fiction novel where essentially plantation slavery, the antebellum south is transported and transposed onto the world of an interstellar spaceship um, called Matilda and basically the passengers on the lower decks um, are dark skinned and they're living pretty horrific lives at the hands of the guards and the people that live on the upper decks. So different decks speak different languages and even between lots of the decks um, they have different relationships to gender. Most of the low deckers, the lower deckers seem to be women or non-binary so there was an added kind of literal gender element 
um, to their place within the ship and their place within society. Um, so Asta, who is our main character, is an intersex character. She doesn't particularly sort of identify herself, um, but her pronouns in the novel are female. And she sort of experiments with her gender expression. Um, and she also doesn't seem to be neurotypical in the way that she socially interacts with others. Um, again, she doesn't identify with anything particularly, so I don't want to label her myself. So I wanted to, so much to love this book because it is kind of beloved um, in science fiction circles. I just could not love it. I just couldn't. For all sorts of reasons, I just, I sort of dragged my way through this book, unfortunately. In lots of ways, it just seemed quite messy. Um, like the visualisation of the ship is something that people talk about a lot on the reviews. Um, it just doesn't, you just can't visualise it, the description doesn't seem to be very helpful. The plot is all over the place with lots of kind of needless scenes and distractions to my mind. I kept asking myself just kind of like why is this here, why are we talking about this? Um, and the plot seems quite thin. I think that might be why there's some distractions but and I think I needed more backstory or something I needed more description of how they ended up on the ship or maybe a little bit more about some of the cultures on the ship I didn't want to know just that this deck was different from this deck I wanted to know why they were different lots of the elements just seemed to kind of be chucked in a little bit and also there was quite a lot of description of some of the science which also didn't seem quite fully realized or kind of understandable. I wanted to know, for example, why deck, different decks had different gender expressions. Um, does this have some relation to the world before Matilda? Um, and they had different developments, or in what way does it affect different people on the decks um, and how the guards see and react to them? Um, is it something that allows people to be creative? Um, is that why they kind of have different gender expressions on each deck? Or is it something that further restricts them. And you get sort of hints of things, but it's just never quite explored fully. There are important ideas here, like the inheritance of family trauma and a really inclusive cast of characters, which is great. Lots of people are gonna find representation in here that they usually don't find. So that's also why I wanted to love it so bad. Um, but yeah, it just failed to offer its characters much hope, particularly with regard to the ending, which I thought was not great, but Jessie from Bowties and Books loved this book. I actually watched their video the other day and Jessie loved it. So I'm going to leave a link to their video down below so that you can go and see someone else's opinion on it. But it just wasn't for me, you guys. It just felt kind of like a, a mess. But yes, that is everything, you guys. I hope that you guys enjoyed this video. I have actually, for the first ever time, written a July TBR because I'm trying to change the way I read again. But maybe I'll talk about that in a vlog or something. Um, but I should have lots of good books for you guys um, next month. So yes, thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed. And I will see you again very soon. Bye.